All right, here we go. It's June 16, 2023. This is the Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. This week, a new drug approval, a new spa variant, a spondyloarthritis variant, new rules for methotrexate monitoring. Are you kidding me? And what about a new approach to depression? These are all the things that we need to practice rheumatology. A study was published this week from the Hostess not hostage, hostage study, hand osteoarthritis in secondary care, 519 patients. A little tidbit from the study says that inflammatory diseases are not the only diseases that get morning stiffness. Prolonged morning stiffness, as you know, is greater than an hour, thought to be the, the uh, I guess, the the marker for inflammatory arthritis? Well, in this very large cohort of hand OA patients, 70, 17% have prolonged hand OA more than 60 minutes. Mild in about a third, intermediate in about a third, severe in about 20%, extreme in 4%. Hand OA patients with morning stiffness have more pain, worse function, worse quality of life, a trend towards worse x-rays. Is it just the patients with more severe hand OA? Again, it didn't go into whether this was, you know, had characteristics of inflammatory, erosive OA. I think this was garden variety hand OA. And you know what? I put this up there because I think it's true. I think the whole, you know, rheumatologist um, belief system on morning stiffness is really misguided. It's not that predictive. It's predictive when it serves you well. But my goodness, half of fibromyalgia patients have prolonged morning stiffness. Um, uh, You know, in lupus, I don't know where it's going. It's not helpful. You know, maybe in bad PMR and bad RA, but what about bad gout? They don't always have morning stiffness. Again, Fred Wolf taught me many years ago, it's not actually the duration of morning stiffness. Maybe it's the severity of morning stiffness. I tried to study that in my clinic. And I had a scale that patients would score how long it was and how severe it was. I didn't think it helped very much. I think we should abandon morning stiffness. But then again, you'd have to give up your rheumatologist card if you did that. That's just my thinking. A meta-analysis of 62 studies, 16 long-term open-label extensions looked at the risk of malignancy associated with JAK inhibitors, specifically they compared placebo-treated patients to those treated with TNF inhibitors, methotrexate, and JAKs, and they showed that the malignancy rate was about 1.1, 1.2 um, uh, cases per 100 patient years, that the neoplasia risk with JAK inhibitors is no worse than placebo or methotrexate. And again, here the confidence intervals cross one. But the cancer risk with JAK inhibitors, when compared to TNF inhibitors, was higher. Um, An incident rate ratio of 1.50, and that was significant. So again, this brings up the issue. Do JAK inhibitors cause more cancers? I'll bring up the converse issue. Are TNF inhibitors better at protecting against cancer risk, as was seen in the oral surveillance study? I think that the cancer risk of all these drugs is really low. I don't think there's good evidence that JAK inhibitors cause the cancers out of proportion to other drugs. I think TNF inhibitors are just better in inflammation, and inflammation may drive cancer risk. But you can look at that data and come up with your own opinions. I saw an interesting study about gastroparesis and RA. Do you see that? I really don't. But now that I think about it, you know, I had a few, and they have to be treated by GI, and they're taking gastroparesis drugs. This is a, a national inpatient sample. Uh, this is patients hospitalized in the U.S., a very large database, 1.5 million RA patients, 1,070 hospitalized for gastroparesis with RA. When compared to patients who didn't have RA, RA patients have an increased risk of gastroparesis, a 36% increased risk with an odds ratio of 1.36. Risk is higher in those um, in adults up to age 65, but not over age 65. Those with diabetes, those with, di- those with um, uh, RA and certain income levels, basically middle to high income, um, but not like really rich. Um, is this real? Is this fishing for a p-value here? Do you see it? I don't know. I thought it was worth mentioning. 
Bimikizumab uh, was recently approved in, by the EMA for use in psoriatic arthritis and axial spondyloarthritis in the European Union. It was previously approved uh, there and in other places for use in plaque psoriasis. Um, that would be the EU, Canada, UK, Japan. But bimikizumab is not yet approved in the U.S. for either psoriasis or PSA. All the trials are done. I would expect that it would be approved sometime in the next six months, maybe the next few months. Bimikizumab, as you know, is a dual um, anti-IL-17A and anti-IL-17F inhibitor. It performs like the other um, uh, IL-17 inhibitors. It may be a little bit better in skin than joints, but it looks good. The data looks good, and it's probably going to get approved for sor a clinical uh, for psoriasis very soon, and probably next year in the United States for psoriatic arthritis. I don't know how long it'll take to get spondyloarthritis in the United States, but at least if you're in the EU, you can actually start using it for PSA and SPA. Speaking of SPA, I found a really bizarre little report of 54 patients with non-radiographic axial spa. You know who those people are. They're kind of not that common, but they are common when you, when you look for them. They have inflammatory low back pain, don't have radiographic changes, have an, either a high set rate or CRP or may have MR evidence of inflammation. Well, in these 54, they actually had other features that made them different than other non-radiographic. These patients had recurrent fevers. And in all of them, fever preceded spondyloarthritis. Um, the fevers were 38 to, 7, to 42 degrees centigrade. Um, um, they were about 40 years of age. They had the usual diagnostic delay in getting diagnosed with non-radiographic axial spa. They had 61% with arthralgias, 44% myalgias, arthritis in 41%, GI manifestations in a quarter, rash in 22%. They responded better to TNF inhibitors than IL-1, colchicine, or DMARDs. Is this really real? This is, I think, interesting. I would like, I wish they would actually do more extensive analyses of these patients. I think it would be um, really interesting to see if this is uh, yet another unique subset of spondyloarthritis. Speaking of spondyloarthritis, do you think hydradenitis is a feature or belongs in the group of spondyloarthropathies? I often wonder this. So this study uh, that, that I put up on Twitter of 2,800 pediatric patients with hyd hydradenitis suppurativa finds that they have a higher risk of Crohn's disease than do controls. It's about a five-fold higher risk. The rate is really low. It's only 0.7%. The control was 0.17%. But yet that's a higher rate of uh, with an odds ratio of 4.90. Um, and the question is, is hydradenitis part of the spondyloarthritis spectrum? We know the Crohn's is, right? Um, I've often had the same question about Sappho patients who have the same kind of pustular um, lesions um, and then they have, you know, axial disease and really um, arthritis of amphiarthroses, sliding joints uh, in the chest wall and whatnot. I don't think there's good evidence to link Sappho to the spondyloarthropathies. They're not usually B27 positive. But if you look at hydradenitis, uh, this association begs the question, and then you look at the drugs that work in hydradenitis, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, um, used to kinemab as, as, as been used. Um, I, you know, I think it might belong. Um, uh, and if you look at the literature on this, there's not a lot of discussion, but there's a little bit out there suggest it might be. We'll see. Time will tell. The Karolinska um, has um, contributed to our knowledge about um, periodontitis and the risk of RA. They have a um, study called the SARA, SARA study, S-A-R-A, secretory antibodies in RA, 132 patients. They, found, they were found to have higher um, levels of uh, IgA antibodies to um, antigens associated with P. gingivalis, much higher in RA patients 
when it was found, was associated with uh, disease activity, but not necessarily associated with ACPA and not necessarily associated with periodontitis. So I think this adds to the body of literature about the role of mucosal invasion and earliest onset of RA. Interestingly, it does not involve ACPA. Um, also coming from Sweden was a cohort study looking at women um, with RA and their children and whether or not RA is a risk factor for developing an autism spectrum disorder. You know, there's a little bit of literature out there that RA patients are at higher risk. It's a, it seems to be more of a North America thing than the rest of the world thing. Um, there are some studies that say no, but uh, the preponderance evidence suggests that yes, maybe. In this study, 3,600 children born to mothers with RA, 1.9% were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. The, if the RA diagnosis was before delivery, there, is a, there was a statistically increased risk of these autism-related disorders with a hazard ratio of 1.43. And it was more likely in those who are seronegative with a hazard ratio of 1.61. Uh, something to look for in the future. Um, you might remember last year at ACR, there was a report that got a lot of buzz um, about um, depression and higher mortality rates. This is data from the Dan Bio Registry, and it finally got published this week. Um, 11,000 RA patients, 55,000 comparator controls. They showed that RA depression was associated with a five-fold higher risk of all-cause mortality in the first two years of disease. Overall, depression in RA was associated with a three-fold higher risk of all-cause mortality. Um, mortality was highest um, in who? In those under age 55. So it turns out that in this study, um, uh, those people with depression versus people without depression who didn't have RA also had a higher risk of all-cause mortality. So um, there's plenty to worry about with depression. Um, and that's why I put up another article that I wrote that said why depression screening should be mandatory at each visit. It seems like a number of meetings in the last few years have made underscored the devastation associated with depression in our disorders. Um, it's a common comorbid condition. It leads to more pain, more ER visits, more healthcare costs. When you have depression, it screws up drug responses, mainly by driving pain, um, but patients who have depression do worse almost regardless of the diagnosis, not just RA, lupus, spondyloarthritis, JIA, it's, better. it's across the board. Patients uh, with depression have a higher death rate, not just in this RA study, but also other studies. Depression often is not managed in outpatient clinics. You know, you have 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and it's not on your high on your list of discovery uh, and therefore, it often goes unrecognized. I don't think we, can, we as rheumatologists who understand this data and certainly want our best efforts, our best therapies to work, we need to identify depression and anxiety and refer it and, or treat it. And that way, we'll get the best we can out of our therapies. Without that, you're really going to have bad outcomes for your patients you're treated. What can you do? My suggestion is ask the patient. Ask the question at every visit. Have you considered depression or suicide in the last two weeks or include that on your survey form or use the available survey forms from the ACR or from room now. That's actually a link on the website uh, or download the PHQ nine. The PHQ nine is basically a hack for depression. It's like eight questions, four columns. It's pretty easy to do. You could include it. Uh, with your intake patients, with the patient, with the intake papers, the patient fills out before they see you, and it's scoring is pretty easy. Less than five, they've got no problem. Five to ten, they've got mild depression. Ten to fifteen, it's moderate. So on and so forth. And I think that's important to consider. I would strongly recommend we change the way we practice by doing this. Um, speaking of ex uh, depression. A study of 162 axial spondyloarthritis patients found that half of them have abnormal sleep behavior, more so in women than men, significantly so. And um, such patients were much more likely to have depression and worse health-related quality of life. 
So again, depression creeps, creeps in. It co it's a co-conspirator with poor sleep um, and, and poor outcomes. So just asking about sleep should then lead you to ask about depression. Lastly, there was, I think, a, a really interesting study and in sort of a data analysis of a large cohort of patients um, in the UK clinical practice research data link. It's called CPRD, data collected between 2007, 2019, about 27,000 patients. They looked at lab monitoring for patients on methotrexate. So 27,000 patients on methotrexate, they identified 2,200 events. The events were uh, an abnormal lab test that would lead to drug discontinuation. And the question here is how often should we be doing um, laboratory monitoring on methotrexate? And what they saw was a rate of 6.5% uh, for all the patients as they were monitored, or with an event rate of 25 per 1,000 patient years. So if you're following 1,000 patients, you're gonna have, they're going to have at least 25 discontinue methotrexate because of uh, an adverse event or toxicity in the next year. Most of you follow about 500 patients, so it's about 12 patients will do this. Predictors of who you should worry about in this group were diabetics, those with um, stage three chronic kidney disease. Those who, upon starting methotrexate, in the first six months show cytopenia or LFTs. These are the high-risk patients. The authors of this, patient, of this paper suggested that if the patients have our low risk with less than 10%, maybe you after you start the drug, do your usual two or three monitoring um, uh, labs, um, after that, they may only need monitoring every six to 12 months. Patients who have a, a moderate risk of 10 to 20% maybe should continue to get monitored every three months. And there might be some people um, who are at higher risk, might have all those predictive risk factors, and maybe it needs to be every two months or every month. Again, rheumatologists are all over the board on this. Some are actually doing monitoring every one to two months. I do, you know, once the patient's stable, I do it roughly every, every three months. This data really goes down the, the way I have been thinking about this. I'm now at a stage, if someone has had three or four labs, all stone cold normal on an optimal dose, a, a working dose of methotrexate, I'm going to probably do it every six months because that's when my follow -up visits are. They're doing well. When they're not doing well, I see them more often. I'm going to monitor them more often. Um, it remains to be seen whether this will be adopted by guidelines or by individuals. Think about it. That's it for this week on the podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.